Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, what I'm talking about today is a sickle cell disease. And I heard Francesca saying that the autism and, uh, is in the news every time you, or, or you open a magazine or a, or a newspaper. It's there. Sickle cell disease is not. Uh, particularly sickle cell disease in Africa, where sickle cell disease is most common. So I'll use this opportunity to mercilessly sell the, uh, the plight of sickle cell disease in Africa and hope that this message will, uh, will resonate with some of the audience. Now, there are only three things you shouldn't do in a live performance. Working with animals and children are two of them, and trying to show a video is the third. Now, but I hope this works. Uh, so... Uh, just because this is a very mixed audience, most of you don't know much about sickle cell disease or, or its cause, which is malaria, I'll start off just by giving you a background of malaria. Malaria uh, in, is a, in, an insect-borne transmitted disease by, m by mosquitoes, uh, inoculated by uh, malaria uh, sporozoites. The disease goes on to multiply in the, the liver before spending most of its life cycle in the human in the red cell. So here you can see a, a mirozoite entering a red cell, multiplying within the red cell. Uh, so it, it multiplies to about 10 or 20 times. Uh, after 20, 48 hours, uh, it then uh, so it spends 24 hours it's hiding in the deep vascular endothelium here uh, before it's released into the circulation again to, to form the next uh, life cycle. Now. Malaria is still a huge killer. Historically, uh, it has been the biggest killer in Africa. 50% uh, of children under five have historically been dying in the last 5,000 years, in the first five years of life. And the biggest cause of death uh, almost certainly has been malaria. So children with severe malaria, this is a child um, with cerebral, uh, cerebral malaria and severe malaria anemia, very sick child, um, modern um, uh, medicine can reduce the mortality from these conditions to about 10%, but still, that's a pretty high mortality. Historically, without any treatment, these, this, this would have been associated with extremely high mortality. So I've been working in this field for 20, nearly 30 years, actually, and my, my first uh, entry into this was uh, uh, through applying in the back of a, uh, the Lancet to a small ad for a job in, in the South Pacific. And the advert was put in by this gentleman, a fellow of this society, who some of you probably know very well as David Weatherall. Uh, and he wanted uh, someone to go out to this, the Pacific Islands of Vanuatu to, to work on um, the question of how malaria uh, and uh, whether, whether thalassemias, the, the red cell inherited disorder, thalassemias, protects children against malaria. This man here, who's JBS Haldane, uh, actually was, I noticed when I'm putting this talk together, a, a, a fellow of uh, University College London. Judging from this year's competition, you wish you had a few more JBS Haldanes to join the society this year. Uh, he suggested in 1949 that, um, that the thalassemias may have risen to very high frequencies because they protected against malaria. And it remained from 1949 up until 1992, when we went to the Pacific to try and uh, look at this question, that it remained unproven from the point of view of epidemiological studies. So uh, I spent three years in the, the Pacific Islands here of Vanuatu and a, and a particular small island called Santo, also uh, populated by smokers, just like David Weatherall, uh, where there's a very high frequency of thalassemia alpha thalassemia in particular. Uh, I don't know whether you can spot me on the left there. That was, <laughs> I know I haven't changed an iota in 25 years, but uh, I spent three years looking at uh, thalassemias and malaria and had and discovered lots of very interesting things, but failed to prove that thalassemia was protective against malaria, largely because uh, for a very interesting situation, not very many Although there's a lot of malaria in the South Pacific, not very many people get severe malaria, and there's very little malaria-specific mortality. So we were unable to, to prove the point in, in, uh, in the South Pacific, and it became very clear that in order to, to study malaria properly, you have to really go to Africa. So I went to Kenya, uh, who I see are our close neighbours on the other side of the road, two doors down from the academy. 
uh, and to a research unit in Kalifi on the coast of Kenya, read, led by another smoker, um, Kevin Marsh, also a fellow of this society, very uh, successful uh, malariologist, who led the program in Kalifi for 25 years. Clear at this point that <laughs> I would get nowhere in science were I not to take up a pipe myself. I duly did so and found that uh, I was able to prove the point in, in Africa that uh, the thalassemias are very strongly protective against severe malaria to the degree of about 40% protection. So it took a long time to come, uh, but it was worth the wait. Uh, there's another non-pipe smoker, that man also a resident of Khalifi uh, for part of his scientific career. This is um, Alison, who f was the first to uh, come up with the, the other malaria hypothesis, the hypothesis that sickle is protective against malaria. So he, pro he proposed this in 1954. And it's amazing that when I went to Kenya in uh, 2000, the year 2000, there were still people who doubted that sickle cell trait was actually protective against malaria. And so some, many did but there was still some uh, doubt about it. So the hypothesis is the sickle cell trait, uh, an, an inherited uh, condition of the red cell, uh, protects against malaria. Uh, we've, in the last 15, 20 years, done a, a large number of studies, not just on sickle cell trait, and, uh, and, uh, but other, other red cell and other genetic polymorphisms looking at malaria protection, but focusing on sickle cell trait working across um, along, 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 in a very large group of countries in sub-Saharan sub Africa, I think there's no doubt now that sickle cell trait is very, very strongly protective. 85% protective against severe malaria. I don't know whether many of you in your studies ever come up with a p-value of 10 to the minus 225. It's a rare one. Uh, and it generally, when you see a p-value of that uh, proportion, then you believe the result. So... Malaria, uh, it protects against malaria. Now, I'll just show you a little bit of data. I know it's a mixed audience, so I'm just a few slides that just to show you that sickle cell trait protects you against malaria. Yep, sure. This is a, sickle, this is a case control study of admission to hospital. 20,000 children admitted to hospital over a five-year period in Khalifi in Kenya. Sickle cell trait is 40% protective against being admitted to hospital. Clearly, the most strong f effects are against malaria. So it's against about 85% protective against severe malaria and about 60% protective against uncomplicated malaria. But interestingly, very interestingly, it's also very strongly protective against being admitted to hospital with all sorts of other things, uh, including specifically bacterial infections that have got nothing to do with malaria. Why would, why would sickle cell trait protect you against invasive bacterial diseases? And the answer is that malaria is a very bad thing and it predisposes you to lots of other things. If you get malaria, you become malnourished. You, you can get uh, sequestration of malaria parasites in the gut and other places that lead to a breach in your intestinal mucosal integrity. So malaria is a very bad thing to have, uh, and you get rid of malaria, and you get rid of lots of other things that go alongside malaria. And sickle cell trait, even today, in studies that we're doing now where mortality is considerably less than 50%, is very strongly protective against all cause mortality in the first five years of life. So this, in a cohort study of 20,000 children that we've been following, uh, you're 40% less likely to die if you've got sickle cell trait. So it's a fantastic thing it, to have if you live in that malaria endemic environment. Um, and it, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's just a, the strongest known uh, selective, uh, sort of a, a protective uh, gene known to man. So the consequence of that is that a lot, an awful lot of people in sub-Saharan Africa are born with sickle cell trait. 15 to 20% of children in most of that band across the middle of a part of Africa where there's a lot of malaria are born with the condition. And the consequence of that is that about 1 or 2% of children are born with sickle cell disease. Now, this isn't such a good thing to have. Sickle cell trait is a tremendous good thing to have. 
sickle cell disease is a very bad thing to have, particular, particularly if you live in a malaria endemic environment with lots of exposure to infections, etc. So again, I'm going to, going to see if I can uh, show you another little bit of uh, video. Might be a, pushing my luck a bit, but let's try. Okay, so this is uh, a live uh, video microscopy, and you can see what happens to red cells when they're deoxygenated. They crinkle up uh, and become sickled. And if you reoxygenate that sample, they bounce back again. So it's a reversible sickling of the red cell. These are, this is now a, um, a, a micro flow assay uh, situation. So, so you can see that the, the gaps between these little pegs here are only about two microns. So under normal circumstances, these sickle cell red cells flow through these pegs very nicely. But then when you deoxygenate the sample, they don't. They start to sickle, and they start to block off those little pegs. And the blood can't move through those pegs, so they cause a, a log jam. You can see on the end there. And then you reoxygenate the blood again, and the blood starts to flow through again. So this is happening in sickle cell disease patients all of the time uh, in their deep capac uh, capillary beds where the oxygen is at low concentration, the cells sickle, and they cause chronic, uh, uh, chronic uh, organ dysfunction. It can cause acute problems with pain and uh, uh, particularly painful crises, but uh, chronic long-term problems where children are chronically anemic, they've got chronic pain, they've got uh, uh, um, uh, an accumulation of end organ uh, damage. So sickle cell disease is not a very good thing to have. If you're born with sickle cell disease in London, uh, you are almost sure to live until you're 18. So there's very low mortality in this, these, and there are lots of data from the States, Europe, that show the same thing. We screen for it, we pick it up early, we put people on special treatments, and you've got a very low mortality in the first 18 years of life. In Africa, the situation is entirely different. You've got um, no routine screening for sickle cell disease. No one knows they've got the disease, and things happen in the background while, you, while uh, people die while, uh, without knowing their status. We don't even know, because there's no screening and there's no um, active surveillance for this condition, we don't even know how many people are born. Uh, we tried to work this out a few years ago with a colleague, Fred Peel, here, who at that time was in Oxford and has now moved to Imperial, who used the world literature to map the gene frequency of sickle cell trait across the world, and it looks like this. This is a heat map of the population frequency of sickle cell trait, so the dark red bits are about 20% population frequency, and the lighter bits are about 5 or 10%. So the, what that translates to in terms of the global burden of sickle cell disease itself, the, the inheritance of the abnormal form of uh, sickle cell uh, that causes such problems, is the world map looks like that. You've got uh, almost all of the disease occurs in Africa and India. 91,000 91, children are born every year in, in Nigeria, 40,000 a year in the Congo, and about 44,000 children per year in India. And in total, globally, about uh, 330,000 children are born. So a third of a million children are born every year with this condition, which, we don't, which is invisible in Africa because we're not looking for it, we're not testing for it, and people are not, it's not visible, and, there's nothing, and, and people are not, not concerned about it. What happens to these children is shown on the, this graph here. You don't need to, uh, to look at it too carefully, but it means that about... So in cross-sectional surveys in the community, uh, sickle cell disease has gone down from one or two percent in newborns to to uh, to less. Well, what, these are these are percentages. Yeah, two percent in some places down. Ninety percent of children are dying in the first five years of life, mostly without a diagnosis ever having been made. So we, we've taken on this course to try and look at some of the natural history of sickle cell disease in our in our setting in uh, Kalifi in on the coast. I've just uh, completed a study of 20,000 consecutive admissions to the hospital. And I'm just going to show you a couple of graphs that show you what, what, the, what it looks like if you've got sickle cell disease in this environment. This is the incidence of admission to hospital, both overall and with a, a range of specific diseases in children without sickle cell disease. These are, not, these are normal children. This is the incidence of hospital admission if you've got sickle cell disease. 
So you can see that all calls admission to hospital, about 55% of children are, are admitted to the hospital each year. So the incidence is 50, I think it's 57 per 100 years of observation. If you've got sickle cell disease, it's only three if you've not. So that's a, a big difference, a big problem. These are looking at the multipliers, so looking at uh, the times more likely it is to be admitted to hospital with specific things if you've got sickle cell disease than if you've not. And you can see that for certain things it's 70 or 80, 80 times more likely. What we've found is that the incidence of bacteremia, a very dangerous thing to have in that environment, about 4 to 10% four to per year. Huge. Uh, four, imagine that. 4 to 10% per year. Come in, uh, are admitted to the hospital with a severe and uh, life, what, what would be a, a terminal illness without the antibiotics. And for some things, like osteomyelitis, the risk is 600 times the background risk. And strokes, which hardly ever happen in children in, uh, anywhere in the world, you've got an, an incidence, uh, an appreciable incidence, about 5% per year in children with sickle cell disease over a certain age. And the, the rate is 500 times that of background. So this is a, a huge problem. In particular, things like severe anemia. I'll just show you some data. So about 20% of children, 20, 20 per 100 years of follow-up uh, admission to hospital with severe malaria, severe anemia, hemoglobin less than 5, mostly needing blood transfusion. In this, uh, in this area, 30% uh, of uh, sickle cell anemia admissions uh, have got severe anemia, and 10% of all transfusions given in this area are to children with sickle cell disease. Now, these are children who are 1% at birth, but are rather rare throughout most of their life, uh, the rest of childhood, because of their high mortality. But they have a very high uh, requirement for transfusions. So this is a problem for children, it's a problem for the hospitals, it's a problem for, he for the health system, and it's a problem for, for society. So we estimate it now that sickle cell disease as a single condition is responsible for between 5 and 16% of all mortality in children under 5 in, in much of sub-Saharan Africa. I can see uh, we're being moved on, so I'll just come quickly to the end. The situation, whether we like it or not, is changing very quickly. So we're seeing uh, a very rapid diminution of all-cause mortality in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa. The, 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 map, the, the graph for Khalifi, where I work, looks like this. In 1999-2000, when I arrived there, we had a, an under-five mortality of 100. That's 10% of children born will die before their fifth birthday. That's now down to 20. Uh, in comparison, UK is about five. So we're, we're moving down towards almost European levels of under-five mortality in some areas. We can see that the, um, the prevalence of sickle cell disease amongst children admitted to hospital as time has gone by has gone from rather low in that most children were dying to a lot of children surviving and it now representing 10% of all admissions to the hospital. I'm not a mathematical uh, modeler, but I can draw a straight line and that's uh, what it looks like going forward. If you, in, in the next 10 years or so, we will have between 15 and 20 percent of admissions to our hospital will be with one disease. Now that's a, a disease that's worthy of further study. Uh, and so I'll leave, it to, I'll leave it to that. I'll just leave you with a map here to show you the problem. It's a really big problem. It's a really silent problem. It's not something that people are talking about. And I hope to use my, uh, my position now in the society mercilessly going forward to, to promote it going forward. Thanks.